I'm John Hinderocker, president of Center of the American Experiment. We are proud to have Congressman Tom Emmer with us this morning. Congressman Emmer will talk for a while, and then I've got some questions for him. If you want to ask a question, type it in the, uh, if, you, if you click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen, that'll bring up a box. You can type a question, and uh, we'll get to as many of those as we have uh, time for. Uh, Congressman Tom Emmer has represented Minnesota's sixth district since 2015. He is a member of the House Republican leadership team as part of the House Republican Steering Committee. He played an important role in the House Republicans successful 2020 election as chairman of the National Republican Congressional Committee. Congressman Emmer, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thank you, John. Can you hear me? Yeah, a little more volume would, would be good. All right, I'll it pick it up just a little bit. I am right side up, I hope. <laughs> Amen. Good morning, everybody. Thanks uh, thanks for being on this call and thanks for having me. I want to thank John Hinderocker and his entire team at the center uh, for putting this event together and, uh, and hosting us. Um, obviously, I'm Tom Emmer, and John just told you I have the privilege of serving as the representative for Minnesota's 6th Congressional District. I also serve as the chairman of the National Republican Congressional Committee, which is the campaign arm for the Republicans in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, again, I'm grateful that you invited me to join all of you here today. During my time in public service in Minnesota, the American Experiment, which is known as Minnesota's Think Tank, has produced research that I know I have relied on, as well as many of my peers in public service, uh, to inform our votes and our legislative work. Uh, frankly, the American Experiment's research on the economy, uh, the, uh, our education system, healthcare, and state and local governance uh, has not only added to our cultural experience here in Minnesota, but it really has added to the political and legislative discussions here in this state and beyond. Uh, John, for that, you should be uh, commended as your entire team should be. Uh, in addition, your emphasis on free enterprise, limited government, personal responsibility, government accountability are all values that we share, and they guide much of the work that I do uh, in office. Personally, the, uh, the center has always been an important, important point of connection for me. Uh, Mitch Perlstein, Kathy Kirsten, Ron Ebensteiner, uh, you just go down the list. Uh, all of you that have been involved either uh, advancing these ideas or funding these ideas have been incredibly important to me personally uh, and also to uh, many of our public ser servants across the country. All right, so I'm grateful again to be here and look forward to answering some questions. But first, I'd like to give you a quick overview of what we accomplished in the last uh, election cycle and what it means for the political landscape ahead. During the 116th Congress, my first uh, opportunity to chair the uh, National Republican Congressional Committee, uh, more commonly referred to as the NRCC. Uh, this, by the way, is a post within our Republican House leadership team. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, the leader, Kevin McCarthy, is the number one post. Uh, number two is our whip, Steve Scalise. Number three is our conference chair, Liz Cheney. And then, believe it or not, number four is the, uh, the head of the political arm, uh, of the NRCC, and that would be the position that I hold. Uh, while our goal in the last uh, cycle was to retake the House, I'm incredibly proud of the work uh, we did as a team. And ultimately, though we didn't accomplish that goal, uh, we did amazing work. Uh, in fact, as of this week, uh, number one, we held every incumbent, every Republican incumbent in the House, which has not happened since 1994, Number two, as of this week, with Claudia Tenney being sworn in from New York's 22nd District, we have now flipped 15 seats. Uh, to give you an idea of what that means, it is now 222 if, if we had a full complement of representatives. It'd be 222 Democrats to 213 Republicans. You need 218 votes to pass anything out of the House floor. Uh, this is the smallest or most narrow majority minority since the 1890s. It's pretty significant. And I attribute the success to recruiting some of the most diverse candidates our Republican conference has ever seen. In fact, I'm incredibly proud to tell you that of the seats we flipped, all of them were veterans, women, 
or persons from minority communities, uh, which add an incredible amount of diversity of experience and background to the Republican conference in the US House. I, look, I, I said from the beginning, I, I told uh, my colleague and the guy that I will make the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, uh, that we shouldn't be talking about our party as needing to be more diverse. The Republican Party is incredibly diverse on the street level. We just need to make sure that our elected representatives actually start to reflect that diversity in the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, in the United States Senate, and in uh, state legislatures all across this country. Uh, we saw the diversity right here in candidates uh, running in Minnesota in the second, third, and seventh districts. Candidates like newly uh, sworn in Congresswoman Michelle Fishbach and veterans like Kendall Qualls and Tyler Kistner. Now, the divisions within the Democrat caucus, I know, John, people want to talk about divisions in the Republican caucus, but that's because they don't want to talk about the significant divisions within the Democrat caucus. Uh, the Democrat Party that my grandfather loved so much, uh, these, uh, differ these differences and divisions, uh, there is an all-out uh, uh, war going on within that party between the liberals and the socialists. And, and make it very clear, the blue dog Democrat is a thing of the past. You might be able to find one or two, but it literally is a fight between what we would have called the San Francisco liberal within the last six to 10 years, and what today they have proudly announced they are socialists and they're pushing and pulling that party farther to the left and toward a socialist agenda that quite frankly is out of step with Main Street America. Now, again, we're proud of our success this cycle, but we worked extremely hard to make it happen. Uh, and, and by the way, this next cycle is going to be as big a challenge. You know, I, I spent the uh, last two years, John, not only representing my district in the great state of Minnesota, but traveling the country and selling people on what our plan was to retake the house. The people on this call know, because some of you I talked to, more often than not, I heard across this country, Tom, we love your enthusiasm, but I think the game is in the Senate. And, you know, I was told right up until Election Day, John, that we were going to lose 15 to 24 seats in the House. I never wavered. Anybody who talked to me knows I told you regularly for two years, if we have a great night, we're picking up 25 seats or more. If we have a good night, we're going to pick up 8 to 12. Well, guess what? I was wrong. We picked up 15 and we held every incumbent. Nice to be wrong, but we got to finish what we started. Now people are saying to me, Tom, the game is in the House. Okay, well, the game is in the House and the Senate. But those of you who think that just because history shows us since World War II, the party that is not in the White House in that first midterm, on average, picks up 27 seats, everybody better readjust their sights. It is not going to be an easy walk. We've got to make sure that we reestablish the election, restore the integrity of the process, make sure that legislatures and legislatures alone are making the election laws, not governors, not secretaries of state, not the courts, et cetera. We're going to have to go back to the same formula that was so successful last uh, cycle in recruiting the most diverse, best candidates that come from the main street of their districts that look like their districts and sound like their districts. We got to have the right message and we're going to need enough resources to, uh, to, to do this thing, to pull it off. So anybody who thinks it's going to be a walk in the park, I uh, need to understand that it's, uh, it's not going to be a walk in the park. Keep in mind too, it's a redistricting uh, uh, cycle. What does that mean? A lot of you have complained over the years that we are getting more blue and more red. In, in reality, in the last Congress, there are roughly a hundred seats that are truly competitive. It doesn't mean that not any one of those remaining 200 or 335 seats isn't capable of flipping on any given year. They're all capable of flipping. But in terms of truly being that plus or minus five that could go uh, every two years, uh, it was down to about 100. Keep in mind, it's the states that draw the lines. And the states this time are going to draw the lines again, and they're going to narrow that 100 even more. In fact, the top end might be 60 now. In other words, the floor for the Republicans is going to get higher and the ceiling is going to get lower. Uh, it, it, I don't think you'll see majorities of 240 members plus after this uh, next redistricting. 
In fact, the greatest majority you might see going into the future, unless somebody addresses this issue, is probably 235 seats. It'll probably top out somewhere around there. But this is something we're going to have to deal with. Look, it's, uh, it's about that messaging. I'm happy to talk to you about all the different things, John, that, uh, that go into this. But we, we had a message last time. Uh, it was about law and order. It was about the economy. People are going to want to talk about Trump. You're probably going to give me questions about where should Trump be in this process, et cetera. Uh, what about the division within the Republican Party? Look, guys, they want to talk about anything but what is actually happening. And as this thing passes, as the emotion starts to come out and, and things start to settle back down, people are going to be looking very carefully at the Biden anti-energy agenda in which he, on his very first day, signed executive orders that killed the Keystone XL pipeline and the 11,000 great paying American jobs that it supported. On the very first day, he signed a moratorium on future fracking on federal lands. These two, uh, two actions on their own cost us roughly a billion jobs in the energy sector or related to the energy sector. And I'm sorry, a million jobs in a billion with a B in tax revenues. Uh, this is why we won states, by the way. Uh, it, we won seats in states like New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma, because we warned them that this was going to happen. And guess what? Now it's happened. It's going to help us in states like Pennsylvania and beyond. Uh, it, you also have to look at the school issue, which I hope we talk about. Schools are going to matter. People uh, want to say, well, you know, that's 2022, and by then it's going to be taken care of I, as a parent of seven children. Thankfully, the last one is a freshman in college. I'm going to tell you, the damage that they have done to our young people over the last 10 months, you have not just lost a spring in school. You have not just uh, lost a fall in school. And you might be able to make a different argument to me for college-age students or graduate students, but for our elementary, for our, our middle school students, for our high school students, the damage that you are causing is a generational issue that we are going to be dealing with for years to come. And they told us, follow the science, follow the science, follow the science. And now the science says, open the schools and put the kids back in the classrooms. And what are they doing? The dirty truth is they're siding with the teachers unions that funneled $40 million to the Democrats in the U.S. House of Representatives. And so they are not going to help. And the, uh, the local, uh, your, your governor and your state legislatures have the same special interest problem. And, and it's going to come back to haunt them. And I'll, why don't I do this, John? Because I've got lots of opinions, obviously. You've got uh, a great audience. I'd love to talk about whatever they want to talk about. Thanks again for having me. Congressman, I mostly want to ask you about some policy issues, but I feel like I need to start with kind of the elephant in the room, and that is this, this impeachment proceeding, the second one going on now in the U.S. Senate. It seems completely bizarre to me. You know, the Democrats are not attending to the people's business. They're not trying to get anything constructive done. They have unconstitutionally, in my opinion, uh, they're now trying a guy who's not the president, uh, what's what's happening here? Is, is this going? Is it, why are they doing this? And and do you think it's going to work for them in political terms? No, no, John, it's not going to work for them. Uh, it, it serves as a as a distraction right now. And and for the people who are on here who think that uh, you know the president was guilty of something that should be an impeachable offense, that's not. I don't think what you're asking, John. The bottom line is, uh, look, we've had a transition of power. Uh, you, you talk about unifying the country. Remember, 74 million people voted for Donald Trump. Uh, you've got to take into account that if you want to unify the country, the quicker we move on, the better. Now, if you think you're talking to your base and this somehow uh, is going to help your base, uh, think again, because you're, what you're literally doing is you're keeping Donald Trump on the front page of the paper and on the front story of every news show uh, today, and that's, you want to move on, right? Uh, so, no, I don't think this is going to help them. In fact, I think this is a, a classic example of overreach. I think uh, if Joe Biden was serious about unifying the country, and if the Democrats were serious about moving forward, and they want to win in 2022, John, then forget about the executive orders killing the, the, uh, the uh, energy industry. Forget about this 
uh, agenda-driven uh, alleged coronavirus aid package, right? And let's get to a transportation bill. It's a mistake that the Obama administration made. It's a mistake that the Trump administration made. Start this thing off with a large infrastructure bill that includes rural broadband, includes seaports, airports, uh, major uh, thoroughfares. Do something that both sides have an obligation to do going home and see if you can break this uh, lack of leadership that we have currently in Washington, D.C. Right now, it's just serving to drive everybody farther apart. Congressman, I want to pick up on what you just said there, because as we all know, both the Senate and, and the House are really on a knife's edge in terms of control. You know, the Senate's 50-50, the House, as you say, the very narrow majority. So what does that mean for legislative agendas? Are we looking at a couple of years of, of gridlock here? Is there anything significant that can actually get through Congress? Well, so the answer is to you, the last part. Is there anything that can get through Congress? Yes. Uh, they're going to get it through either with us or without us. You see that they've already made this clear on the coronavirus aid package. They talked all about a bipartisan solution. Uh, people on this call should understand they're talking about a $1.9 trillion bill. By the way, $1.9 trillion is what the Trump administration agreed to give Nancy and Chuck Schumer last September, and they turned it down. In fact, they whittled it down until it was $900 billion that was passed in just before the end of uh, December, and $300 billion of that was new money. The rest was repurposed CARES money. And John, there's $1.4 trillion that has been, uh, uh, it, it has been approved through the CARES Act or through this uh, subsequent coronavirus aid package. $1.4 trillion still remains to be implemented. Uh, so what do they do? They say, because they know they're not going to get Republican votes to advance what is an agenda, not actual aid, because Republicans would agree on targeted aid for specific industries that are currently in need or people that truly have uh, are on, in your terms, the knife's edge because of the coronavirus and they're not able to work, etc. Uh, nobody's going to turn their back on them, but they're not interested in working with us on that. They said they're going to go the reconciliation route, which is just pounding this thing through. So back to your question, if that continues, uh, I'll give you an example. I think you're going to see immigration reform, but they're probably going to do it on their own. They have the votes to do it. And here's the consequence to them. It's kind of like uh, last night in the Energy and Commerce Committee, Richard Hudson, a representative, Republican representative from uh, North Carolina, offered an amendment to redirect money that they want to put in this 1.9 trillion to vaccinations for teachers and school workers to ensure that our schools open quickly. I, to bring this home, Angie Craig is one of the handful of targeted Democrats who voted no to that. This is how they get held accountable, which we will do every single day, John. And perhaps by holding them accountable, perhaps that will bring them to the table. They can talk sense to their leader, Nancy Pelosi, and say, look, I want to be competitive in my next election. So I want to do what my district wants as opposed to the agenda you're pushing. That's the only hope we have. And the, the margin's close enough that if this becomes uh, uh, tenuous or, or strained enough that we might see some movement that way. So... Um... As you've just been pointing out, enormous amounts of money have been appropriated and spent on alleged COVID relief. We're now they're talking about another 1.9 trillion. In the last year, we have seen unprecedented money creation in the economy, and there's never been anything like it. Is is there still a constituency in Washington for for spending restraint? It, it seems like it's all uh, gone out the window. Well. You know, I, I put out a statement before I voted for the CARES Act in uh, uh, April, I think it was, that this is the ultimate Hobson's choice for somebody like me, right? I, I went to Congress because this, to me, is the number one issue, is this debt that uh, we're saddling on my kids and future generations, which, quite frankly, uh, regardless of all the other challenges we have, is the biggest threat to uh, their freedom in the future. And uh I mean, I felt I had to, to vote for it back. I, I'll just tell you, Jan, I actually had this with, uh, with President Trump back in July of 2019 because I'm in leadership 
I was told I had to vote for his budget. I, I told him that next time, if that's the way it works, invite me into the negotiations because I'm not going to be in leadership and have you shove something up my nostrils uh, and tell me I have to vote for it. And I'll short circuit the uh, discussion, but let's just say right after the vote, where I did vote no, uh, I was at a uh, meeting in the White House with the president and uh, uh, Mitch McConnell, his all his campaign folks, all of ours, and I... Uh, <laughs> Let's just say he got up from the table. They'd already been going for a half hour when Kevin McCarthy and I walked in and he said, Kevin, great vote. Thanks. And he said, Tom, great job. You were with us, right? Uh, no, Mr. President, I wasn't. All right. Well, you can imagine how that went. He was uh, he actually respected the fact that I voted the way I believe. But I think this is the number one issue, John. And there are tons of people in our tons is a, a kind of an elementary way of saying it. It isn't just Tom Emmer. There's a whole bunch of us. And, and it's going to get louder and louder. I think it should have been louder a few months ago, right? I think we should have been talking about this because this is a Republican value that uh, I think some looked away from over the last couple of years. The uh, last administration said to me when it started, we need a runway. We need a runway, you know, where it, uh, less than 2% uh, uh, GDP with Obama leaving. We've got to build this back up to three plus. Once we get there, three, four, five percent then we can start talking about paying it down. Well, I said, until you show me a plan, I'm a no. They never did come up with a plan how they were gonna pay it down. The pandemic hit, we had the best economy in decades. Lowest unemployment for women, lowest unemployment for Hispanic Americans, lowest unemployment for African Americans, all kinds of good news. The pandemic hit, yes, these are extraordinary times. I think we've taken extraordinary measures, but this insanity, John, to continue this now, uh, yeah, targeted relief where it might be necessary. I, I, I actually would consider that despite my uh, my serious grave concerns about where we're headed towards this $30 trillion number. Uh, but in the meantime, let's implement the $1.4 trillion that's already out there. And Congressman, it seems to me that rather than, than spending trillions of dollars in government money to support unemployed people and try to repair economic damage. Let's get the economy open again. Let, let's end these shutdowns. Let's get people back to work. I mean, isn't, isn't that the better answer than endless government spending? Well, it's, it's interesting that you bring it up. First, I would preface this with all of us have to respect our healthcare workers, our doctors, our, our healthcare professionals. Uh, we have some of the best in the world and their hearts are in their heart. They know what they're advising us even if they don't agree 100% of the time. That being said, John, you just hit the point that I made to our governor last April, which he has ignored, which is we can't just look at this problem through the healthcare lens. We have to look at it through a much broader lens. I mean, you're gonna be dealing with mental health issues in our adult population because their livelihoods have been destroyed, not because of them, and by the way, you can argue it's because of the virus, but the virus isn't the one that said you can't go back to work. You know, that little shoe store that's right across the uh, street from the big box store, they both sell shoes, but apparently the big box is essential. And the little guy, the little mom and pop shop, by the way, who don't have the big website, who don't have, but they're, they're the backbone of Main Street, Minnesota, they're told, hey, you're just going to have to sit here and wait. And then they look across the country. It's not just that they're told they have to sit here and wait, but you got elected leaders that have a double standard. I mean, look at Nancy Pelosi. She, she passes a rule that I now have to pass through a metal detector, incredibly, to get on the House floor. But then she proceeds to walk around. By the way, if I walk around the metal detector, she'll take $5,000 out of my bank account. That She passed that as well. But it's this double standard. It's the governor in uh, California who says, you know, all these Main Street businesses are shut down, but I'm going to go out and have a fancy dinner with all these high rollers, and I'm, I'm above all this. It's, uh, these are interesting times, but these leaders, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, John, I think you, and I, I asked him back in April, are you running economic models alongside next year health care models? Uh, and this is what we've seen, right? It's not just a matter of protecting people from the coronavirus and the very serious I, uh, in some cases, fatal uh, consequences of that virus, but it's also about protecting from addiction, uh, domestic abuse, 
uh, you know, some major, major uh, issues. And I don't know that we've been doing a good job of it. So to your point, get the thing back open as best you can. Congressman, I want to circle back on, on a related issue uh, just to, to a comment you made uh, earlier about education. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think what, we're, what we've done to our younger generation uh, in the last year has been a crime. And I, I mean that very seriously. Now, this is mostly a state issue. You know, um, is there anything that you and Congress can do to try to uh, get America's schools back operating for the sake of our children? Yeah, it's, it's this money that's uh, been uh, approved for purposes of the coronavirus. Make it tied to the fact that you have to do certain things. You have to open your schools. I mean, for goodness sakes, John, I walk through the local grocery store here and I stand uh, within three feet of the uh, person running the register with wearing a mask with a uh, piece of glass between it. And a teacher stands 15 to 20 feet in front of the room. Uh, the dirty little secret for everybody on this call is the CARES Act had money in it last April that our governor could have directed towards uh, uh, equipment to retrofit schools so that teachers could teach safely and students could to, uh, attend uh, uh, school. And he chose to use it for other things. I mean, John, I, I'm afraid as a parent uh, and as a policymaker, I'm afraid that in the future, this is not just a matter. You, you don't turn the switch off on a child's formative education and then flip it back on. I mean, this is, uh, this is going to have lasting consequences. And then the anecdotal uh, information we're getting from Los Angeles and even St. Paul, Minnesota, where you've got some of these kids in the inner cities that haven't even logged on since it went uh, online last, uh, last spring. Look, it's both tragic and it's an opportunity as I look at all of these. This is a great opportunity for people to start talking with their legs, you know, parochial schools, private schools, uh, they all have uh, increasing uh, uh, enrollment because they're in school and the kids are doing just fine and the teachers are doing just fine too. Uh, this might be one of those come to Jesus times for uh, our public school system who we got great teachers, we got great administrators, but you know, they can't allow their hands to be tied by these incredibly powerful union bosses that uh, just don't want us to go back to school. One of the things that we saw in the first days of the Biden administration, and maybe it's still going on, I, I've kind of lost track, but Joe Biden issued an unprecedented number of executive orders the minute he, he took office. Talk about that a little bit. I mean, it seems to me that... Um, on, on the one hand, the Democrats keep talking about unity. On the other hand, the first thing they do is, is bypass uh, Congress and, and issue very controversial executive orders. How's, how's that going over? Yeah, you're, you're right, John. He's now over 60 executive orders. I think he did 17 that first day. Uh, by the way, more than Trump ever did, more than uh, his other predecessors ever did in this uh, uh, quick of fashion. I think it, it's uh, that same thing. I, you know, you say one thing, but you're doing the complete opposite. It, we, we're going full circle to, uh, you know, we want to unify the country. We want people to start working together again. Uh, by the way, uh, it's our way or the highway. And since I can't get it through the Senate right now because I've got them too busy with an impeachment proceeding that perhaps is unconstitutional. And since uh, the House is having their own meltdown between the socialists and the liberals, and Nancy just trying to keep control of this thing and, and move it in, in a direction uh, to the left, guess what? I can give the uh, base of this party, the new base, which is the socialist left, uh, in all these different special interests, uh, you know, the uh, eliminate fossil fuels, you know, they, they don't want to be an all of the above energy party. They want to go right back to the same failed policies they were doing under the Obama administration. Uh, is there a problem with solar? Is there a problem with wind? Is there a problem? No, none. But it should be an all of the above energy policy. By the way, not only are his executive orders, John, indicative of a imperial presidency, right? Not a democracy, not a uh, not the constitutional republic that our founders envisioned. But his uh, his actions uh, show us that he doesn't have much confidence in the, uh, the current makeup of the House and the Senate. I mean, that's what it tells me because 
Otherwise, wouldn't you uh, advance this right away? These are our priorities and this is where we should go. Uh, he hasn't even done that. So it's going to be very interesting to see uh, how they try to pull this together. My hope is, because I am a glass half full kind of person, uh, I am hopeful that they get through this period, this, uh, this impeachment process, this first six to eight weeks, and they start to settle down, John. We start to settle down and recognize we've got to get a major infrastructure bill down, uh, done. I, I know they were having a meeting yesterday over in the Senate to see what was possible on that. If they can, if they can resist their, uh, their never ending urge to make it a political statement, I got some hope. Maybe uh, by mid-March, you might see something where Republicans and Democrats, rank and file in the House, are actually working together on something that might be productive for Americans. If they don't, John, I'm going to make it very clear to everybody on this call, which I did to a colleague of mine in the Minnesota delegation when he tried to tell me that these socialist left voices, it's a very small group with oversized voices in his, uh, his caucus. I said, uh, and I won't give away who he is. You'll have to figure it out. I said, look, uh, that may be true, but if you're not willing to stand up, speak up, and fight to pull my grandfather's party back towards the middle, I'm going to make sure you own it all when we get to the election. You know, you're talking about Biden's executive orders. Uh, in, in some of the first executive orders, he essentially suspended enforcement of the immigration laws. I don't think that's putting it too strongly. I think that's essentially what he has done. And you mentioned earlier something that I found a bit chilling, which is the idea that the Democrats may have the votes, I suppose with Kamala Harris breaking the tie in the Senate to push through an immigration bill. Talk about that a little bit. I mean, what, what do you see coming down the pike? There are, there are two wild cards uh, in the Senate, but before I get there, let's think about this for a second. Because this goes to that other question about uh, what about President Trump? I think as Republicans, I, we should recognize that the Trump administration uh, implemented some amazing policies. I mean, his tax cuts for the middle class, his energy policies, his Americans and America first policy, which I think my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are more upset about that than anything else, because they're the ones that usually think about these messaging genius things before any Republican and Trump beat them to it. America first, that's their idea or so they think. But as Republicans, John, I think we need to celebrate those policies because those are the policies that brought so many new voters into our party, right? Uh, the Democrats, uh, our, our new Democrats on the other side, they have promised that they're going to unwind it all, much like this immigration stuff that uh, you just brought up. And they're gonna run into major problems when they do that. If you think about this, safety and security are, is still polling among the top concerns of all Americans. That's what this issue goes to. And you're right about what Biden did. It's not only what he did, but I think it was in the, in the Washington Post, somebody from his administration and perhaps even him earlier this week was quoted as saying, we have abolished ICE without really abolishing ICE. I mean, think about that for a second. Now, the problem they're gonna have on their road through the Senate uh, right now are two senators, Manchin in West Virginia, I mean, he might be the only Democrat left in West Virginia, for all we know, uh, and he's well aware of that. Uh, he's made statements that certain things are not going to get across his desk and not going to get his vote. Uh, and the other one is Kirsten Sinema out of uh, Arizona, who is uh, quietly probably going to be more influential than even Joe. Uh, and I mean, I served with her in the House. I, you know, Kirsten is a bit of a political chameleon. But she's, uh, she's very smart. She didn't get there by being stupid. And she understands that she represents a border state, John. And I think, uh, I think that's going to create some problems for them. Because if they lose both Manchin and Cinema, then uh, Kamala Harris doesn't matter. Yeah, that's right. Um, one thing we haven't touched on at all, Congressman, uh, so far is foreign policy. And uh, I think most of us are concerned primarily on the domestic front these days, but I do wanna touch on it briefly. I mean, in my opinion, uh, Donald Trump was our most successful president since Ronald Reagan. And I would argue that you see that in domestic policy and you also see it in foreign policy with uh, improved uh, trade agreements uh, and uh, uh, standing up to China in particular, as well as as well as Russia, 
And now we see in progress what looks like a massive sellout to the Chinese Communist Party. We see Trump's achievements in the Middle East, where he helped to, to help to bro broker these peace agreements between, between Israel and some of the Gulf uh, Arab states. That being under attack, I mean, to talk about that a little bit, is there a risk here that the Biden administration is going to undo all of these foreign policy achievements of President Trump? I, actually, John, it looks like they're trying to adopt them. The real problem that I'm seeing is uh, there's no respect for this administration. They don't have a, uh, they have a track record, Joe Biden does, of 40 years that's completely different from the track record that Donald Trump set for the four years that he was in office. And truth be told, because I probably have talked to some of you four years ago, I didn't like the way the president started his uh, foreign policy, his trade policy. Uh, in retrospect, he was right. I, I think uh, he did have some major success and he did some things that should have been done for years, not the least of which was moving the, uh, the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem, which should have been done long before he did it. And he was told that was going to be the end of, uh, of peaceful life as we know it in that region of the world, and it didn't turn out. I think right now, you see uh, Joe Biden trying to reset his relationship with the Chinese. Uh, you saw a report within the last two days about his, uh, his first phone call with the Chinese leader, in which it was characterized on this side of the Pacific as he was getting tougher. He's calling him on these issues and you know, you're gonna have to, uh, you're gonna have to buck up and start doing this stuff. You know how it was characterized in China? I shouldn't ask you, John, because you probably do know how it was characterized in China. It was characterized as the, uh, the Chinese leader was telling the president of the United States, you're gonna need to cooperate with the Chinese. Uh, it's uh, completely different, you know, I. Uh, one thing about uh, President Trump, you can complain about a lot of different stuff, but the State Department, he was trying to shake loose years of uh, uh, partisan politicos that were in all these different offices, and uh, they were resisting every day they didn't want to go. Uh, it's really where we got to get this thing cleaned up. The Chinese investment in the United States, the Chinese investments, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it, in United States politicians, uh, very dangerous, probably the greatest threat we have. And uh, you look at the other stuff, John, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, well, I'll be careful because he's, uh, he and his uh, colleague predecessor who are now out of, obviously they, they're out because they were in the Trump administration, but they were working on intelligence trying to uh, make much of this public so they could talk about it. Uh, all I can say to you is I was told early on that the alleged hack by the, uh, the Russians I uh, back uh, at the time of the election, you know, within the last two months, it was in the news. These episodes were nothing more than our enemies starting to test the Biden administration. They knew that there was a transition happening and they want to know what they're dealing with. It's uh, someone has described it to me as it's like boxing. When you get two heavyweight boxers, what they'll do to start the fight is the challenger will lean in because they want to see how hard the other uh, is going to hit them. And once they measure what that is, then they, uh, they, they set off on a strategy as how they're going to win that, uh, that fight. So I think that's what we're seeing more of right now. I, I, my uh, belief is the Biden administration is trying to continue some of these Trump policies, but adopt them as their own. Hmm. Uh, and right now, they're just running into uh, enemies that are trying to see how tough they are. Well, I hope that's right, Congressman. I want to turn now to some questions that we've been getting from members of, of our audience. One thing that is on a lot of people's minds, and it's a huge problem, I think, is, is the censorship of conservative voices by the big technology platforms. I, they really don't want our, our voices to be heard. Now, here in Minnesota, there's a bill that's been introduced or is being introduced in the Senate, shortly will be introduced in the House. Uh, which is intended to address this. I know that the same thing is going on in, in other states around the country. I've been in contact with people in other states. What about at the congressional level? Is there, is there anything that you folks are working on to try to address this problem? Well, you'll remember Al Franken pushed his net neutrality thing a while back, which is a little different issue, but the Democrats don't typically uh, do what we want them to do in this area. It's has indicated a willingness to look at uh, Section 230 reform, which uh, 
we'll see where that goes. But you got to look, uh, if you're me and you're, you're being realistic, uh, don't listen to what they say. Look at what they're doing. And Joe Biden, you better take a look at all the big tech people he put in his administration. There's a reason for that. I mean, uh, that doesn't bode well for addressing what I believe is the number one crisis uh, in this country. And we have many of them. But you start shutting down free speech. You start shutting down uh, people's ability to speak out. I mean, that's what this whole uh, constitutional republic that uh, gives us this freedom is based on, is us being able to disagree and yet live peacefully together. Uh, that's not what they're, they're going for. Now, good news, uh, and it relates to the redistricting that I didn't talk about before. Uh, we may not have uh, succeeded with the presidential race, but we had huge success in the, uh, the House. Remember, they said we weren't going to be able to hold the Senate. So the fact that we ended up tied and we had the Georgia debacle Okay, maybe people had higher expectations, but they told us months ago we weren't going to be able to hold the Senate. That was the last firewall. Look down below. Uh, we won the majority of state legislatures across the country. In fact, uh, to put it in perspective for you, Republican-controlled state legislatures will draw upwards of 150 of the seats of the 435 in the U.S. House of Representatives. Democrat-controlled legislatures will uh, draw somewhere around 70. Uh, split legislatures like ours here in Minnesota will draw uh, roughly 40, and then commissions will do the rest. So from a state level, John, that's where you can start to attack this, and we need to. I don't, I don't know how much success you'll have in Minnesota, but I think uh, reasonable Democrats, and there are reasonable Democrats, I'm just saying they're not uh, currently occupying the U.S. House of Representatives Democrat uh, conference. Uh, and and. I, I will stand by that if anybody wants to question me. But there are reasonable Democrats. There are friends. Uh, they understand this is a huge issue, too. And maybe uh, those of us together on Main Street starting to talk about this and how dangerous it is will get uh, both sides to put aside their partisan uh, values and start to push for some real reform. I'm not confident, though, uh, right now in the congressional uh, approach. Congressman, I think we've got more questions from our audience here on election integrity than anything else. And again, this is largely a state issue, but I think the Democrats have introduced legislation that would uh, actually undermine election integrity even further. Talk about that a little bit, if you would. So HR1, I like to go around and talk to uh, groups about, you wanna know what our colleagues' priorities are? I mean, they tell you it's your healthcare. They wanna take care of your healthcare. They tell you it's your safety and security. They want to take care of uh, allegedly law and order, although they want to have it both ways. Uh, they want to take care of all kinds of things, your, your transportation needs. Really? Their number one priority, and it's referenced by the very first bill they filed in the 117th Congress, is election reform. And it's not election reform. By the way, this was the gift that just kept given in the last election. We use this, depending on the district, uh, to win seats. How did we use it? Well, it has things in it like a up to $5 million in taxpayer funds to subsidize congressional races. Come on, John. I mean, they wanna legalize ballot harvesting. They wanna do all these things that frankly take away from the integrity of our elections as opposed to improve the integrity. And you're right, it is a state system, but uh, I can tell you probably more so than ever before, Ronna McDaniel is the chair of the RNC. My new uh, counterpart, uh, Rick Scott from Florida is the new chair of the National Republican Senatorial Committee and myself, we're going to start working together. Mark Elias, on behalf of the Democrats, had a two-year plan that had been built for years on how to sue to change laws. I, I will take issue with uh, Steve Simon, who I get along with Steve just fine. We, were, uh, we served together in the Minnesota legislature, but the idea that Steve Simon can settle a lawsuit with a third party and change election laws is unconstitutional and should never happen. Uh, your members should watch. We will, so short answer, we will lean in across the states, uh, in the states across the country, Rana, Rick, myself, with whatever resources we can help them with so that they can reassert their legislative authority to make these laws and to get rid of these uh, laws that, you know, if, you, if you're the nice person, you say they were enacted by in people acting in good faith to protect the right to vote during a very serious health crisis. Okay, great. But now they have to go away. 
Uh, you have to get back to uh, integrity. And I'm going to tell you, we've got uh, one of our, our friends in Minnesota who told me the story of his mother passing away eight years ago. She lived in New Jersey. Uh, four years ago, she didn't get anything from the state of New Jersey. Guess what? This election, she got a live ballot. <laughs> she passed eight years ago, and he still holds that live ballot. How did they find her? Who was doing this? We, we got to put the integrity back into our elections. And I think we can watch a, uh, a lawsuit that's going to go up to the Supreme Court. Uh, it's that Pennsylvania lawsuit. Granted, it's about Pennsylvania. Those, uh, you know, the, the date that you could accept absentee ballots by or mail-in ballots, etc. But hopefully that will give us some good law in terms of reaffirming its state legislatures that make these laws and all the other ones are unconstitutional because that'll take us a long way back towards reestablishing the integrity that I think we lost. Yeah, I think you're exactly right about that, Congressman. The settlement, so-called settlement, uh, which was just collusive that we had here in Minnesota, was one of, I think, 15 or so around the country entered into by Democratic uh, secretaries of state. If we've got time for just one more question, Congressman, I want to ask wait. about something that a couple of our our um, attendees have, have raised, and that's gun control. You know, the Democrats feel like they're in, in control in Washington, and once again, they're rolling out their, their gun control program, and H.R. 127, I take it, is, uh, is the bill. Can you talk about that a little bit? Is there, uh, is there much prospect of, of something like that? What is it, number one? And number two, is there much prospect of it becoming law? Well, I, you're going to have to tell me who the author was. I'm not good with the numbers, but the uh, there's plenty of these, John, and what I would say to you is, uh, we're at risk. There's no question we're at risk with, uh, even though there's slim majorities on both sides, we're at risk that they just pound something like this through because they, they just, it, my, my new colleague on the other side, Sean Patrick Maloney, he thinks he's going to tie Republicans to this conspiracy theory QAnon, okay? Just to give you an example, this is how misguided they are. Uh, for those of you that are on this call that even know what QAnon is, because most people don't, you need to understand that CNN just came out with a poll in the last couple of weeks that fewer people in this country believe in QAnon than people in this country who believe the moon landing was staged. So my, my point is this, they're, they're so deluded in their view of Main Street, John, we need to be very aware that they could pass any gun uh, law through the House and the Senate and across this president's desk. But then the one uh, legacy that I think you're going to see pop up more often than not in the, in the coming years is going to be the changes that have been made to the Supreme Court. I think uh, the Supreme Court, the three additional justices that have been added, I think they're going to restore uh, some confidence that you and I and others have been lacking in, uh, in that court in terms of being a, const a true constitutional court that applies the letter of the law that they're given as opposed to writing the law as a pseudo legislature. So I, I didn't give you much of an answer other than to tell you I'm nervous about uh, these uh, highly political issues. And I, here's the deal. If they want to pass that, John, you understand what that's going to do for me and my job as head of the campaign arm? I mean, you want to get uh, voters out to the polls? You do something like that. Uh, they will show up. That being said, I will also tell you, when you have tragedies like we just had in Buffalo a couple of days ago, it doesn't help us. No, that's for sure. Congressman Tom Emmer, thank you so much for being with us. That was tremendously informative uh, and lots of fun. It was great to, to have the opportunity to talk with you. Keep up the great work in Washington. We are all watching you here from, from Minnesota and appreciate what you are doing for us and for all Americans. So thank you so much. Right back at you, John. Thanks for everything you and the experiment do for all of us. Thanks for having me.